Our scripture reading this morning is found in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And I just would like to preface this reading with just a comment. Um, have you ever said the words um, to your children, to a spouse, to somebody? Have you ever said, are you listening? Do you hear what I'm saying? And I know that I say that, um, especially sometimes when I'm in school and I'm subbing and the kids are like, they're you know, I can see that they're all scattered. I'd say, guys, are you listening? And this is what God is saying to us this morning. Um, the title of this is Listening and Doing. And when we say those words, are you listening? There's an expectation behind them. If you're listening, if you hear what I'm saying, then do it. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And this is God's word for us this morning. Let's go to prayer. And as we close our eyes, you know, my heart was starting to resonate with those words, you know, God is saving someone, God is healing someone. And I just thought there, there might be someone here, your heart was yearning, that you want that to be you, that you know you need God to touch you, to save you, to heal you. You were stirring that God is doing something, that you are desperate for God to do something. And as we go to prayer, I would just invite you, if you want to just turn your palms up, just as a way of saying, God, I am ready to receive your grace, your power, your activity in my life. So let's, let's go to the Lord and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are present with us. We thank you that you are a healing God, that you are a loving God, that you are a forgiving God, you are a saving God. And Lord, we offer our lives up to you, and we pray that you would pour out your grace upon our lives. Lord, our, our hearts are open, our palms are open to receive into our lives the good things that you have for us. So Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, Wherever someone is overwhelmed with guilt and shame, we pray that you would bring freedom and forgiveness. Wherever someone is overwhelmed with despair, God, we pray that you would pour into them your hope and the promises of your word. God, wherever someone is wrestling with uh, feeling like you are distant, God, just make yourself known to them in a way that they would know that you love them, that you are near. God, wherever someone is concerned about a family member, we, we think about the Svets family, we pray for Justin's healing. God, we pray that they would know that you are with them, that you are uh, present in a powerful way to bring healing and peace. Lord Jesus, I pray that in every situation that's on our hearts today, those spoken prayers and in those unspoken ways, God, we pray that you would be uh, at work in a powerful way to bring healing in body, mind, and spirit. God, as a church, we want to be empowered by you. We want to be healed not just for our sakes, but so that we are strengthened to go out into the world to make your love known, to make the saving grace of Jesus Christ known through our lives and through our words. So God, give us courage, give us faith, give us boldness to be speakers and doers of your word. God, we pray for all who are on our hearts today. We pray that you would be drawing the lost into a saving relationship with you. We pray, Lord, for those who are apathetic, for those who are on the sidelines, for those who feel like they're just not going anywhere. God, we pray that you would awaken them to how you are calling them to serve you in this world. God, I pray that as we look into this new series of James, as we focus on your word, God, we pray that your word would be deeply planted in our hearts and in our minds, that you would bear beautiful, lasting fruit for your glory. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, what Joyce read just a few moments ago. And this morning, we are kicking off a new series called James Family Rules. And uh, I, was, I was preparing and, and uh, studying for this series, and I was thinking about what, what's a way to understand this book of James? James, that is written by the brother of Jesus. It's written to Jews who were scattered. How many of you know that whenever uh, God's people were persecuted, people would try to stamp out those early Christians? And you know what it did? It just spread them far and wide. So they would be spread from one place into new areas where they would talk about Jesus and live for Christ. But as, as people, as the world tried to stamp them out, uh, they would just spread and, and the church would grow. But James is writing to God's people, these early Jewish Christians who were scattered because of persecution, and he was writing what I would call James family rules. This is for the body of Christ, the family of God. How do we live together uh, in in peace? How do we honor God? How do we live faithful lives? And uh, a few days ago, I was in my living room, and I thought, wait a minute, we have a family rules sign. I don't know how many of you have a family rules uh, decor, a family rules wall art in your living room, but I thought, this reminds me of James. Because James is so, uh, he, he's so brief and to, to the point. He has all these pointed sayings about being quick to listen and slow to speak. If you want to have true religion, then look after orphans and widows and keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Tame your tongue. The tongue is a great fire. It makes great boasts. But James, is, he just tells it like it is. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't say, would you like to take this with ice cream? He just says, here is how it is. Know God's word, live it, and do it and you will be blessed if you do it. And so just like the family rules, this message of James, it's not, you know, sugar-coated with a lot of stories. It's just this is what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus. This is how you do it. This is how you live it. Unlike these family rules, none of these family rules make me say, ooh, that one hits close to home. You know, I mean, we read it and we think, well, that's nice. It's, 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 it's very, you know, pleasant to, to think about all these things, all these family rules and how we live it out. When we read James, if we're reading and really listening, as Joyce was talking about, every so many lines, we're going to say, ouch, he's, he's writing just to me. This is an area in my life, not where I just have to be a little bit better. This is an area of my life that's maybe diagnosing a place where I've been polluted by the world, where I've been too influenced by the world, where God's word needs to come in and wash me and correct me and lead me according to God's ways. And so the book of James is like James family rules, not just for individual families and homes, but for God's family, for the people of God to say, this is what true faith what true religion looks like when we follow Jesus and live a life that is wholly devoted to the living God. Much of what we read in James should sound familiar. A lot of the sayings, a lot of the statements, we read them and we think, you know, it sounds like I've heard this before. And there's a good reason for that. James takes a lot of what he writes as he's influenced or inspired by the Holy Spirit. He writes sayings and teachings that are very similar to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, the greatest sermon ever preached, 5, 6, and 7, but then also the Proverbs and the Psalms. And so James, as a Jewish follower of Christ, is a, and by the way, I mean, if, if we need anything, if we need proof that Jesus is the Son of God, what would it take for your brother to believe that you are the Son of God? Well, James, the, the brother of Jesus, came to uh, view his brother uh, as the Son of God, and he even calls himself a servant, a slave, a, 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 a one who is, is following after Jesus. But um, James, influenced by the, the Jewish scriptures, as he, as he walked in faith, he drew from Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, he drew from the Proverbs, he drew from the Psalms, and he wrote this uh, five-chapter letter to these early Jewish followers of Christ, and these are uh, just for us as well. So this morning, what I want to do is focus on just three 
of three of the rules. And this doesn't uh, outline everything that we're going to talk about today or even in the coming weeks, but I want us to focus on three family rules that we can draw from today. Uh, but before we do, I'll just mention a few things earlier in the chapter because we're going to focus on 19 through 27. But, um, you know, James writes in chapter one about trials and tribulations. So important for Christians who are facing persecution, who are facing arrest, who are facing death because of who they followed and what their faith was. James writes that if you face trials, consider it joy. Consider it joy because it means that through these trials, God is bringing about maturity. God is sharpening you. God is strengthening you. It doesn't mean that God is causing all these bad things to happen, but through your trials and tribulations, God can grow you up and make you a mature follower of Christ. In chapter one, James also writes about wisdom, that if you lack wisdom, ask God for it, and God will give you wisdom. James writes about sin and temptation, and he says that, you know, it, Sin is progressive. It starts as desire and temptation. And if you feed it, what happens? Desire, temptation becomes sin. And when sin is full-blown, it gives birth to death. And so James, when he talks about don't be polluted by the world, he knows that if you allow temptation to creep into your heart in such a way that you feed it and you don't pray about it, you don't confess it, you don't repent of it, that temptation is like a giant snowball that is rolling down a hill. And as it rolls down the hill, it gets bigger and faster and it begins to accelerate and it begins to roll right over everything and leave a wake of destruction behind it. That's what happens with sin and temptation when it goes unchecked. And so there's so much that we could say, so many more family rules than what we can get to, but we're particularly going to focus on the family rules in terms of those that influence our relationships with one another and with God. And so as we look at three rules from James 1, 19 to 27, the first rule is learn to listen to God and others. And so just to repeat these verses in 19 through 21, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. This rule is desperately needed in our relationships. You know, do we live in a culture? Do we live in a world where people come and say, you know, I want to listen to you and I'm sure you're going to listen to me? Or are we more apt to draw lines of division? You stand there, I stand there. We'll just hurl verbal insults and bombs at one another right? Is that more what our culture is when we think about politics, when we think about uh, just differences of belief, differences of opinion, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's po politics, so often rather than being quick to listen and slow to speak, we're quick to get angry, we're slow to listen, we're quick to speak, and we say, let me lob my grenade of what I want to say, and then the other person lobs their grenade, and the weapons just get bigger and bigger, and there's more and more gasoline thrown on the fire, and James says, this is not how it should be. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. You know, we, we often say this, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth. What does that tell you? We should be listening at least twice as much as we're speaking, and yet in our culture, we're so quick to say, well, this is what I think, I don't care what you think, and I'm going to tell you what I think, and I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. And James says you can't have loving, Christ-like, healthy relationships if you're not willing to come before one another and listen. You know, it doesn't weaken your position at all to listen. And in fact, it doesn't strengthen your position to, long, to, um, to launch verbal grenades at the person that you're trying to yell at. It does nothing, and actually, actually, it actually does harm to your opinion. If you're launching verbal grenades at somebody, they are more likely to get resistant and stubborn and cross their arms and not give a rip about what you have to say. But when you come with a, with a humble heart and say, I'm willing to listen to you. I, I may not agree with you, but I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to value you. I'm going to take in what you have to say. Then we are, we're, we're fostering a relationship. We're fostering a connection, even if we don't agree with that person. And you know what happens when we listen to somebody with, with the intent to say, I love you and I value you, even if I disagree with you, I'm going to hear you out. Well, then they say, this is a safe place. And I'm listened to, and maybe I'll also reciprocate by listening to what they have to say. And even if two people don't disagree, and, and even within the body of Christ, we're not going to agree on everything, but we can foster healthy relationships and connection by being willing to listen to one another. 
Listening can dr- dramatically improve the quality of our relationships. John Wesley, about 300 years ago, the founder of Methodism, said this, Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. I love that line. Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without, without all doubt, we may. So he's saying we can commit to love, we can commit to listening, even if we don't agree with each other. I'm going to listen to you, and you're going to listen to me, and that's going to bring us together. You know, it's not just about listening, but it's about being careful. Remember what it says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. That means we also have to give some attention to the words that come out of our mouths. And again, if we just launch a, a verbal assault with our words, people are just going to shut right down. But if we are slow to speak, and careful with our words, we can uh, continue the relationship and get a lot farther in our understanding. But we need to think before we speak. You know, as far as social media goes, I think this has totally infected our culture so that we're just so used to, you know, putting it out. We spew it out there without even thinking. And so what if we would pray before we post or if we would talk to God before we tweet? Um, so often we just, we respond so quickly and things escalate and there's more and more division and we don't get anywhere and then we just unfriend them and then where have we gotten? Uh, we, haven't, we haven't gotten anywhere. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so before we say something, before we tweet, before we post, we can say, is this going to further dialogue and show respect in what I'm doing? Or is this just going to cut off the relationship and leave us frustrated, angry, and like we've gotten nowhere? Gentle words demonstrate peace and love, but harsh words show no concern for the other person. Angry words will make the person resistant and stubborn. It will have the opposite effect of what we want, but uh, careful words will be understood. Careful, careful words will bring people together. Careless words will drive people apart. And so we have to, we have to be uh, slow to speak so that we can use careful words that lead to healing rather than careless words that lead to division and escalation of con- and conflict. You know, it's amazing to think about this, this, this scripture, that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Do you think about the force and the power behind your words? That with your mouth, you can, you can build somebody up, you can encourage them, but also with your words, you can tear someone down and you can destroy them. The power of life and death is found in the tongue. And so when we are quick to listen and slow to speak, when we're careful, when we're prayerful, it's like putting on a posture of humility. It's taking on this, this approach where we say, you know what, you matter to me. And I want, I want to sit and listen to you. I want to hear you out because I want, I want us to be able to invite, invite one another into a safe space with one another. We might disagree, but we're going to invite each other into a safe space so we can show that we value one another. Even if we can't come to agreement on what we're talking about, we're going to show value for one another. And when we have this open posture towards people in our lives, it trains us, it equips us to come before the Lord's word with the same posture where we say, God, I may not like what you have to say about me or about, what, about my life, but I'm going to come with an open heart, ready to be transformed, ready to listen, ready to have you change me from the inside out. James says in 1, 21, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Uh, I have to be gross for a minute, all right? Is that okay? Because James is gross. When he says strip off all moral filth, it refers to two things. Number one, strip off all your filthy clothes. It's like, you know, you got you to strip off the filth that you've accumulated from, your, from, the, the, from the world. But he's also, uh, this is what study does, he's also referring to earwax. It's like strip off the moral filth, the earwax, so you can receive God's word into your life. That's the word picture that he's using. He's saying get rid of anything that will, any filth that will keep you from hearing God's word so that you can receive it and listen and accept it. Isn't that so pleasant? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? (laughs) James was referring to earwax. Get it out of your ear so you can focus on what God has to say. So God wants to plant his word humbly in us, but it all starts with being quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry, coming before others and coming before God with a willingness to listen and, and to establish that relationship. So the first rule from this morning is learn to listen to God and others. And that leads to the second one, which is, do what the word says. And this goes along with what I shared with the kids about looking, at the mir- looking in the mirror and then acting on it. 
listening to the word and then doing it. I, when I read this part of scripture, I'm reminded of a time when I was in high school hockey practice. And for some reason, the coach had us practice for 30 minutes how to dump in the puck. When you get to the center line, dump in the puck, far side, on the ground. That's how we're going to dump in the puck. Then we'll all know when we're racing down the ice exactly where the puck's going to go, exactly how to attack and forecheck and try to uh, get into position to, to score a goal and put some pressure on. So that's what we did for like 20 minutes. Skate down, get across center line, dump the puck in, far side, on the ground. It was like we did that. It's like, okay, coach, we got it. Well, sure enough, right after that drill, we get into a scrimmage situation. And one of our big defensemen comes down, crosses center ice, of course. What's he going to do? Dump the puck in, far side, on the ice? No. Flips the puck haphazardly into the air. It hits the rafters on the wrong side, makes this gigantic gong sound, and we knew what was coming. All our heads just go right to our coach. He was livid. And we knew, again, what was coming next. And he said, he blows the whistle, line up along the goal line, boys. And you know what that means. It means skate until your tummies don't feel very good. And, uh, that's what we, and, we, and we had to skate. And it was just one of those cases where we had focused on it. We had listened. We had practiced over and over again how to dump in the puck. And the first opportunity to actually live it out, to actually practice what we had just learned, the guy shoots it into the ceiling and hits the rafters. And the coach thought, you know, we just, we just practiced it. And that's, that's how it is with God's word. So often we can have it all in our heads. But if we're not willing to humbly go out into the world and to live it out, what good is it? And that's what James says. It's like looking in the mirror and not taking any action about what needs to be changed and corrected. When the word of God is planted in our heart, hearts, James says it's for our good. He says it brings freedom. So this whole focus on God's word, God's law, is that it's a framework for, for being transformed. It's a framework for our relationships with God and with others. And we can either live our lives according to the framework of God's word that brings freedom, or we can be contaminated and polluted by the moral filth around us and not look anything like a wholehearted follower of Jesus. But James says, if you listen to God's word, if you do and live God's word, you will be blessed. Do what the word says and you will be blessed. So that's the second family rule for today is do what the word says. And the third and final rule for today is be pure for God, not polluted by the world. You know, whether we realize it or not, we are being shaped by something each and every day. You know, I wonder sometimes in our culture if people are being more discipled by their cable news channel of choice than by God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit in them or more shaped and more discipled by a certain teacher they listen to rather than God's word and the spirit of God forming them? Are we becoming more formed in the ways of Jesus or more formed in the ways of something that we're immersing ourselves in? Scripture teaches us to be formed by God's word to, so that we are pure for God and not polluted by the world. James writes this in verses 26 and 27. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. I wonder how many of us are more discipled by those who have no regard for how their words come out than by scripture that teaches us to keep a tight rein on our tongues and be, to be careful with what we say. Verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James is making it crystal clear. The one who wants to honor God and follow Jesus is the one who is devoted and willing to live completely different than the pattern of this world. And he gets right to the heart. What is pure and spot, spotless religion? To look after orphans and widows and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. He's talking about holy living. Having a life that is set apart and distinct from the world. And so I want us to ask ourselves, what is my life like? What are my attitudes like? My thoughts, my words, my actions. Am I living a life that's being shaped by the God of the scriptures? Or am I living a life that's being shaped by, you know, a group of friends or by TV or by people I follow or by people I hang around? It's very true that we become like those we hang around if we're not careful. The default is to just blend in and become like whoever we hang out with, by whoever we listen to. And so the question is, what is molding me? What is shaping me? Who is leading me to become what I'm becoming? 
That's a question for us. Sin and the ways of this world pollute and destroy even as it spreads, but believers in Jesus Christ are called to be transformed and different so that our hearts are concerned about what God cares about. And you know what God cares about? He cares about orphans and widows and people who are weak and vulnerable. All throughout the Old Testament, there's laws of gleaning where farmers were called to not harvest the margins of their fields so that the poor could come along and after the crops have been harvested, those unharvested crops would be available for the poor and the needy, the vulnerable and the widows so they could get what they needed to sustain them. The scriptures are very clear that God is, God is uh, very protective of the weak that he's concerned about the vulnerable. And remember, in those days, a widow was one who no longer had a connection to a family where she would have a livelihood. And that's why uh, it's so critical in that time period for the, the widows to be cared for because they didn't have livelihood. Very often they ended up in prostitution or in something just as bad because they didn't have a livelihood once a husband died and they were disconnected from a family. But God, throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New, he was concerned about the orphans, the widows, and those who were in a vulnerable position. So when it comes to living in God's, in the world, there are three approaches we can take. This all has to do with be pure for God and not polluted by the world. And so in our parenting and in our way of living, I think that a lot of people take one of three approaches. And so I want to ask you, what approach are you taking in your life and in your parenting when it comes to living pure for God so that you're not polluted by the world, so that you honor God's word in your heart and mind without just blending in with the world? And the first thing that I think sometimes Christians do is they practice isolation. Or maybe they're isolation with your kids and we say, okay, well, we're going to get polluted by the world, so we're going to wrap ourselves in spiritual bubble wrap and we're not going to leave our closets in our bedrooms because we don't want to be polluted by the world, right? We want to be holy for God, so we're going to just be in spiritual bubble wrap, isolation. But the problem is we're called to be salt and light. And you can't be salt and light in the world if you are in bubble wrap in your closet. And so the question is, Are you living a life that is able to shine for Jesus? Are you living a life where you are able to make an impact? And so isolation, I don't think, is where it's at. Jesus was actually criticized for having dinner, for hanging out with the sinners, the tax collectors, those who were considered dirty and filthy, but it wasn't impacting him. So isolation is not the right way to go or else you can't be a shining city on a hill. You can't be salt and light. Some people, though, go to the other extreme. And it's not isolation, it's immersion. I'm just going to immerse myself in culture. I'm not even going to think about how I'm being shaped negatively. I'm going to raise my mind on Netflix and YouTube, and whatever, however I'm shaped by the world, I'm just going to blend right in. And when, we, when somebody lives a life of immersion in the world, they're not distinct. They might be interacting, they might have a lot of relationships with people outside the church where they can where they could be of influence, but the problem is they're so influenced themselves, they're no longer salt or light to have a positive impact on others. So we can't just isolate, or then we're never interacting with those that Jesus wants us to reach. And we can't just live a life of immersion, or else we're, we're just going to blend in with the world. I think scripture calls us to something that's more in the middle, which is insulation. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. And so for ourselves and for our children, We have to equip ourselves, we have to equip our kids to say, okay, I know what scripture teaches. I know how I'm called to live. I know how I'm called to, I know how I'm able to have my my scripture detector on so that I know if something is in alignment or not with God's word. If somebody's talking about something that's far apart from scripture, the little alarm's going to go off that says, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not how I'm called to live. I'm called to live in a way that pleases God. I'm supposed to live a life of love and of holiness, a life of being set apart. And so what we want to do, and this is where we need to pray and ask God for wisdom, is, God, what does it look like to live an insulated life where I am being shaped first and foremost by your word and by the power of the Holy Spirit, but I'm living a life in connection with people you love that you want me to share Jesus with? And so not isolation, not immersion in the world, but insulation, where we're being shaped by Jesus Christ but we're having that impact on the world that God desperately wants us to have as he calls us to go out into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, for the glory of God. Paul writes this in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's immersion, right? When you immerse yourself in the world, you're conformed to the pattern of this world. You live just like this world. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so when you look in that mirror in the morning, and every morning, you know, the more we spend time with Jesus, the more we spend time in his word, hopefully, and and we don't want to do this in a cocky, prideful way, but hopefully the longer we walk with Jesus and live in the word, we look at our image, we look at who we are, and we say, by the grace of God, I am becoming a person who looks more like Christ. If we are just immersing ourselves in the world, if we're being polluted by the world, we look in the mirror and we say, I'm no different than my friends down the street who don't know anything about Jesus and his word. And so when we focus on Christ and his word, our image should be such that we become more and more like Jesus from one degree of glory to the next. And so whose image do you see when you look in that mirror? Yes, a person who's frail and a person who fails and a person who uh, needs God's grace every day, but hopefully it can be said of you and me that as I insulate myself, but as I focus on God's word, I'm becoming more and more like Christ so that when I go out into the world, people see a person who's being transformed by grace into the image of Jesus Christ so that they can look to us and say, there's a person who's following Jesus Christ. Not isolation, not immersion, but insulation. So how about you this morning? Are you becoming a doer of God's word? Are you being quick to listen and slow to speak? Can we go out this week and show value to every person created in the image of God by listening to them, by valuing them? Can we be doers of God's word? And can we practice, can we strive for, by the grace of God, insulation that would allow us to, trans, to be transformed, but also to have an impact on the world around us? May that be our prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word that is able to transform us and heal us, and point us to you and salvation. God, I pray for each and every one of us, and Lord, I pray for the person here who might feel like they've been totally immersed in the world. There might be a young person or an older person who wonders, have I been transformed at all by God's grace? And you are calling them to to go deeper into your plan for their lives as they surrender and submit their lives to you. May each of us, Lord, humble ourselves before you so that your word is implanted in our hearts. God, I pray for the person who's been living a life of isolation. They might know everything about your word, but they say, I'm so cut off from everyone, how am I even making a difference? God, I pray that you would give them courage to step out of their comfort zone, courage to establish new relationships where they can be salt and light, courage to get out of the spiritual bubble, the holy huddle, and into the world where they can make a difference. God, give us wisdom as we seek to be hearers and doers of your word. Lord, we pray that your grace would work within us so that we look more and more like Jesus every day, for we know that is your will for us in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God, do in us, if we go out by the grace of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to put these rules into practice. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Who's somebody this week where maybe you haven't been listening to one another, where you can just sit down and say, you have, you have, I have um, your attention, you have mine, let's sit and talk. What about to God? If you were to say, God, I want to make myself available to you so your word can get planted deep in my heart. What about doing God's word? Maybe there's one place where God wants you to step out of your comfort zone to put his word into practice. Maybe it's to show kindness to one person that you've been avoiding or one person that you know needs some encouragement. And what about be pure for God and not polluted by the world? How can you come before the Lord this week and say, God, I want you to shape me that I might be a person who makes an impact on the world around me? Let's put these rules into practice. Let's not be like those who look in the mirror and then forget what we look like. But let's honor God as we put these rules into practice. Thanks so much for coming to worship. But Let's go out to live for Jesus and to put his word into practice. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you always. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.